So let's say you've successfully deployed your Rails application into production, but how do you ensure that everything stays up and running smoothly? Well, for that, we'll need to set up some kind of monitoring system to restart any processes that might fail or end up using too many resources. Here I want to show you how to set up Monit to do just this. It can be instructed to alert you or restart a process when something on your production machine goes awry. Well, let's get started. The first thing I'll do is SSH into my VPS that is running my Rails application. Now I'm using Ubuntu 12.04 here, so the commands I'm running in configuration might be a little bit different if you're using another version or distro. Now the easiest way to install Monit on here is through apt-git. I'll do that, but first I'll run apt-git update. And then I'll run apt-git install Monit. There we go, we now have Monit installed and running. So let's configure this. Let's take a look at the main configuration file that is already set up for us. It's at etc slash monit slash monit rc. So this file is really nicely commented and I encourage you to read it. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to delete all the comments because I just want to see what the default settings are. So this first line here is telling monit to run in the background and perform the checks every two minutes. I think that number is a little bit high. I prefer to uh, check more frequently, so I'm going to set this to 30 seconds, but you might want to configure this depending on uh, how often you want Monit to check. Now the next several lines here just configure various file paths, and then we have this event queue setting, which uh, basically tells Monit to remember any alert messages that it is unable to send over email. Perhaps the mail server is down. And then this last line here tells it to include any other configuration files that might appear in this confd directory. Now currently there aren't any other files here, but if we want to uh, configure Monit for various uh, processes such as Nginx or Unicorn, then this would be a good place to put those configuration files. Well that's it for this default config file, but how do we instruct Monit to monitor our Rails app? The manual makes for a good resource when you're ready to edit the configuration. I'll check out the configuration examples here. And you can call check process and then provide a unique name that doesn't really matter what you call it. But for supplying a PID file and then Monit will uh, check that process regularly. And you can uh, check for certain conditions and then either restart the process or take some other action when those conditions take place. Now we could set up this configuration directly on our server by going to the Monit uh, conf.d directory and then adding files here. However, I prefer to uh, not do extensive configuration on the server directly, but instead put configuration files within our Rails application under source control. So here's the Rails app that I have deployed. And if you're doing this, I highly recommend creating some Capistrano recipes for setting up your production server like I show in episode 337. This way you can uh, create some templates for configuration files, and these can be easily generated and copied to any server using Capistrano. Now since there are multiple config files that will go along with Monit, I'm going to make a new directory under this templates uh, directory here called Monit, and let's add some configuration files inside of here. I'll make the first one called nginx.erb, so this way we can add some dynamic content if we want to through ERB. So my goal here is to monitor nginx and start it up if it goes down. We could do that by calling check process, and I'll call it nginx, and then uh, we can supply a PID file and that path is at uh, var slash run slash nginx.pid. But we could also make this dynamic if we wanted to through some ERB. I won't be doing that here, but it is an option if we want to configure this through Capistrano. And next I need to instruct it how to start up the program. And that is through uh, etc init.d nginx command, just pass start to that. And I'll do the same, same thing for stopping it. So this is really all the code that's necessary to ensure nginx stays running. Now we need to copy this config file over to the server somehow, and I'll do that through a Capistrano recipe. Under here I'll make a new recipe file called monit.rb, and I'll paste in the code for this recipe. So here I'm defining several tasks. Uh, one, to install monit in case we're on a new server, just apt get install. And then another task to set up monit by copying over the configuration files. So this has this monit config method call, which I'm defining down here, and I'm passing nginx as the name here, so that is the template that's going to be run, and I just basically am moving it into the uh, confd directory and uh, setting the ownership and permissions properly.
Next, the setup task will run two other tasks, a syntax to check the uh, syntax of the configuration files, and it will fail here if it is incorrect, and then reload to reload those config files. And both of these tasks are defined here. Basically, they just delegate to uh, run the service monit command with that given uh, task passed in. Now, if you aren't familiar with defining Capistrano tasks like this, I recommend you watch episode 337 for more information. Now, to get this working, we actually have to include it in our deploy.rb file. So I'll just add this to the list of recipe files that I load in. Now to get this file over to the server, I just need to run the cap monit setup task, which we defined. So this ends up copying over that nginx config file, uh, checking the syntax, and then reloading it so that it's going to be monitoring nginx. So let's try this out. Currently, our application is live and up and running. But if I SSH into my server and kill nginx, then it's not going to work. You can see I get uh, no connection here. Now within 30 seconds, Monit will detect that it's down, and then when I load the page again, you can see it's now working because Monit started up Nginx. Now there is a lot more that we can do inside of an Nginx config. Uh, for example, a common line here when checking Nginx is to see if the number of children processes is greater than 250, and if so, then restart. Uh, this way, if Nginx for some reason gets stuck spawning children processes, then uh, that means that something's probably wrong, so we'll try restarting it. Now, whenever providing these restart conditions, it's always a good idea to handle the case where the conditions might continually be met, and therefore Monit tries to continually restart it in an endless loop. So in that case, we can say if uh, there have been five restarts within the last five cycles, then a timeout, which will tell it to stop monitoring that process. Now a cycle is equivalent to one check, so the time duration of this is dependent upon what you have set in the monitor.c file. Earlier in this episode, we set it to 30 seconds, so this might be about two and a half minutes. Uh, if five restarts take place during that time, then it will time out and stop monitoring. All right, I'm going to move on to monitoring something else, and that is the database, Postgres. So I'm going to make a new PostgreSQL ERB file. And I'll paste in the code for this because it's very similar to the nginx config. A couple of key changes though. One is that I'm using ERB to pass in the path to the PID file. I'm doing this uh, and defining it within the Postgres recipe file here because this is including the version number of the Postgres I'm using. So this way it's a little bit more flexible in case I change the version of Postgres. I only have to change this file and the PID file path located here. And I'm also doing a check here to see if it responds uh, on the port 5432. You might want to move this into uh, the Capistrano recipe as well to make it a little more flexible if you want to change the port. But this is the default port, so I'll leave it here. And then if it's not responding on that port, it'll just restart the process and then only restart it up to five times for five cycles in case it's flapping. So now that we have that new config file for Postgres, we need to copy it to the server when we run that monit setup task. Uh, we could easily just duplicate this line. However, what if our database is running on a separate server than Nginx? Well, we can easily handle that scenario using Capistrano roles by moving these off into separate tasks. So I'll make a new task for each of these called Nginx, and for that we want the uh, roles to be the web role, and that will just do that same uh, monit config line that we had in the setup task, and then we can call Nginx directly from here. And then we want to do the same thing for uh, Postgres, calling Postgres for each of these, and that's only going to be the database role, and then just running Postgres tasks directly from here. So if we do have multiple servers set up in Capistrano, this should copy over the correct monit configs to each server. Next, I want to move on to monitoring Unicorn, which is what runs our Rails app. So I'm going to make a new monit config file here called unicorn.erb, and I'll paste in some code here to monitor the master Unicorn process. Now a couple of things of note. One is that I am using the application name here so that if we do have multiple applications on the same server, there won't be any collision here, so they will have a unique name for both the uh, process name on Monit and also the startup script I have set up already. The other thing is that I'm keeping this monitoring very simple because I'm more interested in monitoring the child processes, which are more likely to leak memory and require a restart from Monit. The tricky part is that the child processes don't have a PID file to point to, but we can get around this issue by writing our own PID file when a child process is spawned. We can do that inside of the unicorn rb config file. 
You might recall in last week's pro episode, number 373, we set up this after fork block to handle zero downtime deployment. But we can use this for writing a PID file as well because it gets triggered whenever Unicorn spawns a worker. So I'm going to paste in the code to do this. Uh, this uh, grabs the PID path to Unicorn and appends the worker number to it and then passes the processor ID into the uh, PID path. So this means we will now be able to reference each child process through our monad config. Now I'm just going to paste in the code to do this. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but I thought it best to keep all this code uh, contained within this one file. Now the way this works is it's going to loop through the number of unicorn workers, and that's a variable I set in the unicorn rb uh, recipe file. And then I'm going to make a process check in monad for each one of those child workers. So this points to a PID path, which is generated in the same way I did earlier, uh, taking the unicorn master PID and adding the uh, worker number to it. Now for starting this worker, this does basically nothing because I don't want Monet to manage the starting up of the child processes. Now that's because the master unicorn process will handle that automatically for us. I'm more interested in how it quits the child process, and that's done by checking if that PID file exists and then sending the uh, quit signal to that given PID ID. And then I'm doing some checks to see if the memory or CPU usage is going way out of hand. Uh, you'll probably want to adjust these numbers depending on your server resources and number of worker processes you have set up. And then I'm just checking if uh, the flapping condition of it continually restarting. And then the last step is to adjust our Capistrano recipe so that we have a unicorn a monet setup task which is on the app uh, role and just runs the unicorn uh, config. And that is going to run when we run the monitor setup task. Now we can deploy these changes. Uh, first of all, since we adjusted the unicorn config, I'm going to run the unicorn setup task to copy that new configuration file over, and also the unicorn restart task. And then I can set up a monitor with the monitor setup task. All right, so that's just going to uh, copy over the configuration files, restart unicorn, and monitor. Ah, oh, the feeling of peace of mind. It's good to know that if our Rails app does act up, that Monad has our back and will restart it automatically for us. But we shouldn't just ignore Monad and have it blindly act on its own. It's a good idea to keep tabs on it. There are several ways you can do this, and one is through the log file. It's a good idea to occasionally check this to see if any errors have cropped up. But this is pretty passive. You might want to set up an email alert system so that you're notified instantly of when there's a problem. We can configure this through the monitorc file on our server, but I prefer to keep configuration changes in the source code of our application. So I'm going to add a new uh, monitorc.erb uh, file to our monitor templates. And I'll paste the code into here. Most of it's the same as the other monitorc file, except for these couple mail-related changes. One is you'll need to set the mail server. This is an example. If you want to set it to an SMTP uh, Gmail server, you'll need to supply the username and password, which you might want to pass in through maybe an environment variable using ERB here if you don't want to include it in source control. And then you'll also need to set this alert to an email address you want to be notified of uh, alerts happening through Monit. Now in this example, I'm going to keep this mail server config commented out since it's not correct, but you can set this up specifically for your environment. Now I'll need to copy that monitorc file to every server, so I'm going to do that under the setup task and just uh, call monitorconfig, config and pass in monitorc, and then I also can pass in a destination as a second argument. That should be at etsy at uh, monit slash monitorc. You can see here that method takes a destination as a second argument. Now you have a lot of control over when alerts are sent. You can trigger them on certain conditions as you would a restart. Here's an example of how you could do a, a performance check on the entire system to see the load average, memory, and CPU usage to see if they are exceptionally high and then send an alert in those situations. Now some processes might be especially noisy in sending alerts, such as a unicorn workers. Well in that case you can override and only send alerts on certain events. You can do this by calling alert and then passing in the email address and then telling it what events you want to be alerted on. In this case, we can be alerted only when the PID file changes at least two times within 60 cycles and then send an alert. So this way, we can be notified of when our unicorn workers are restarting frequently, but not any of the other minor things that happen to the workers. Now another way to keep tabs on Monit is through a web interface. You can enable this in the monitorc file by adding some configuration like this. Uh, this uh, starts up the HDVD server on port 2812 or whatever you set, 
and then we can allow specific permissions and you might want to make this dynamic with some ERB so you don't include the username and password directly in the uh, configuration file. All right, let's try this out by calling monit setup again to copy over our monitrc file. So now when I visit port 2812 on the server, uh, monit is going to ask me to log in and you might want to handle the authentication through uh, HTTPS for maximum security. And then this brings me to the Monit Service Manager, which gives me all kinds of details about the various processes that, uh, Monit, that Monit is monitoring. So you can see uh, further details by clicking on one, and all kinds of good information here to check out about Monit. Now you might also want to check out mMonit. This provides a slick interface for managing multiple Monit servers at once, and you can handle alerts through this, and there's also an iPhone app available. But check out the licensing because I believe it is a paid product, so you might want to look into that. Finally, how does Monit compare to other solutions such as God or Blue Pill? Both of those are written in Ruby, and their configuration is much more flexible. However, they also require more memory to run, which is the primary reason I stick with Monit, because I'm frequently working and deploying to VPSs where the memory is pretty limited. Also, if you're using ERB to generate the Monit config files like I showed you here, then you can get some dynamic flexibility. Uh, for example, you can easily change the number of unicorn workers, and then that can be reflected in the config file that is just reloaded in through Monit. Well, that's it for this episode on Monit. Hope you found it useful. Thanks for watching.